Uh, so my name is Erin Thompson. I'm a professor of art law and art crime here at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And our motto here at John Jay is educating for justice, which is why we're very happy to uh, be involved in this panel, both because we recognize the crucial role in teaching and research of archives and libraries, but also because we hope to contribute our expertise in fields such as security management and forensic psychology to addressing uh, the problems of justice of libraries and archives such as theft. Uh, so today our panelists will uh, uh, speak on the particularly intractable problem of insider theft from libraries and archives. Theft by employees, volunteers, and other trusted people who uh, are not or for reasons of practicality cannot be monitored as closely as outside visitors. I'll introduce all of the speakers first, uh, who will then have around 15 to 20 minutes apiece to talk. Then I will offer a Scout's Honor short summary, and we'll open the floor to some questions. Uh, so our first speaker joining us electronically here uh, is Jean villais egnor the Director of Collections Management at the Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, the museum is currently in the process of recovering artifacts stolen by its former archivist. And Jean has provided a handout that I'll, I'll distribute shortly whose details can help prevent other insider thefts. Then, Jennifer Commons, the archivist for the Carnegie Collections at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia University will speak. Jennifer works with the Carnegie Corporation to select materials for the archives, curate exhibits, and give talks on the history of Carnegie and, the fun and his funded organizations. Um, she has previously worked in other archives, including the uh, David Dinkins papers and is currently under contract for a book on Abraham Brill, the first translator of Freud into English and the first psychologist to psychoanalyst sorry, to practice in the US. Next will be Travis McDade who is curator of law rare books at the University of Illinois College of Law and the author of two books on rare book crime. He teaches a class at Illinois called Rare Books, Crime and Punishment. So I'm glad I'm not the only pun maker. Finally, we'll hear from Larry Sullivan, Associate Dean and Chief Librarian at the Lloyd Seeley Library of John Jay. Larry also has had a wide variety of experience in former positions, from directing the library at the Maryland State Penitentiary, to being the New York Historical Society's Library Director, and the Chief of the Rare Books and Special Collections Division of the Library of Congress. He is the author of the biographies of 20 mobsters whose portraits appear in a just-released folio of etchings, the wonderfully evocative portraits from this work, the Brownsville Boys, Jewish Gangsters of Murder, Inc., are currently on display on this floor, just on the other side of the elevators uh, in the President's Gallery, and I encourage you to go look at them after the panel. Uh, and finally, for help in organizing, I would like to thank uh, both Larry and Nick Pavlik, the director of the Archivist Roundtable Programming Committee. Uh, so now, Sean. Hi everybody. <laughs> I normally have my speech sitting in front of me and my hands are waving it around a million miles an hour, so you'll just have to bear with me over this. Um, I thought what I would do was I would discuss briefly what happened to us, um, give you a little bit of background about our thefts, and then talk about how our thief went around, uh, went about creating a situation that caused the theft. And then, um, finally, I'm going to talk about things that you don't normally hear um, when it comes to museum and library theft, things that we learned that you might find helpful. And a lot of those, that information is contained inside of that handout that Erin was telling you about. And if anybody wants that copy electronically, let me know. Pass it out to anybody who you think it might be helpful to. Um, now, the background for us is that between um, about December of 2000 and September 22nd of 2006, our former archivist was um, removing materials from the museum. Right now, we estimate that about 6,500 items were stolen. There are about 1,360 known buyers. There are a number of unknown buyers, unfortunately. Um, and we know that he was carrying on private sales. About 5,462 sales went to about 26 different countries. Um, about 431 items are just missing. We don't know what happened to them. 
About 520 feet were either recovered during a search of the thief's residence um, or returned by him. And about 338 have been voluntarily returned by about 18 buyers to date. Um, so I only have a thousand more buyers to go. Uh, that one of the things that you need to know about our theft is that we did not discover it. It was actually discovered by a man in Switzerland who got suspicious about marks that he was seeing on the backs of the items that he was buying. And he actually called the museum and let us know what was going on. Um, and it just sort of started from there. We managed to uh, pull together enough information that uh, the thief, whose name, by the way, is Lester F. Weber, don't ever hire him, um, he, uh, the house was searched in 2000, May of 2007. We managed to get a grand jury indictment by about February of 2008, and on the 19th, he and his wife were arrested on 26 counts of conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, making and filing false tax returns, and theft from an organization receiving federal funds. They originally pled not guilty, but we were actually able to compile enough evidence um, that they changed their pleas to guilty, and they were both sentenced in December of 2008. He received about 48 months in jail with about 36 months of probation. Um, they had to file amended tax returns, um, and they were ordered to pay restitution of about $172,000, which was actually just the sale price of the materials on eBay. Um, and then the one thing that we were going after, he was prohibited from engaging in any employment where the defendant has access to archival material or to the cataloging of any archival material. After that was over with, we then spent the next four years working on the insurance claim, and now, as Aaron said, we've embarked on the effort to try and get the materials back. Now, what I'm going to focus on is how our thief went about um, creating a situation that both facilitated and perpetrated the thefts. I'm not going to talk as much about deterring theft, but there's a lot of information in that handout that I created that probably will be helpful. Um, and one of the reasons why I want to focus on how he facilitated it or created the situation that he took advantage of is because I think it's easier that once you understand those things, then creating ways to deter that um, makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then um, some of the lessons we learned, I think, will also be very helpful because you don't normally uh, understand, nobody teaches you how to investigate a theft in your institution. And we've learned some very, very valuable things that I think would be helpful because I think this is a lot bigger problem than people realize. Now, as far as how he did it, and the thing that you need to remember about what I'm, these things that I'm going to tell you is that all of these things were happening concurrently, and they were all essentially um, setting up standard archival practice. So they didn't raise any red flags, and it, it didn't, nobody was really concerned by what was going on at the time. So here are the things that he did that really set up the situation where he could pull those 6,500 or more items out of the museum. One of the first things that he did, because we had never had a formal trained archivist before, was that he began to physically rearrange not only the storage area, but the collections themselves. He reorganized the larger collections. He merged collections. He broke apart collections into one or more new collections. He created artificial collections. And he attempted to reconstitute collections that essentially had been broken apart. Um, none of the changes that he was making in terms of those movements was documented. On top of that, he instituted a new numbering system. And I know that many of you who are listening have probably been through a situation where someone in your organization recommends, oh, let's just renumber everything and start from scratch. It'll make things so much easier. Well, it doesn't. Um, and one of the problems that we had was 
the, the renumbering was not a one-to-one -one change because of the complicated nature of the rearrangements that he had made. Um, he, the, the numbering was completed sequentially by shelf, not by collection. Um, and then he intentionally left some collections unnumbered. And he gave a number of different reasons for that. Uh, he would apply a, a number later on when they were processing or reviewing the material. Uh, or he didn't leave it, he didn't number it because he wanted to fil facilitate additional collection manipulation later on. Or he intended to deaccession or transfer materials to the collections department, um, which we translate now as, I'm going to take it home and sell it on eBay. Um, so that physical rearrangement and renumbering renumber essentially created um, mass confusion. Most of all, uh, it wiped out all institutional memory to the point that only the thief knew where everything was. On top of this, he began instituting um, policies that removed the system of checks and balances that we had in place. And there were many, many changes that were made, uh, but the ones that I'm going to give are kind of the big things that caused a lot of the problems. One of the first things he did was that he re restricted staff access to the collection. He closed off collections um, so that only he had his eyes on them or only archive staff um, could access the materials. He also changed it so that collection processing itself became more of an individual effort instead of a group effort. Um, processing began, began occurring in unmonitored spaces. Um, in storage areas, in people's offices. Um, it, it was a bad situation. Um, there were materials stored in people's offices, including his offices. Um, after he was fired and we started going through his office, there were thousands of, of documents piled up in his office. Um, and all of these policies and procedures that he was setting up were verbal. None of them were written and Apparently, they applied to everyone else but the thief, Lester F. Weber. Um, so once all of this mass confusion is going on, he essentially um, began reprocessing the collection. And as he was processing, he was stealing. And if, what it looks like us when you look at the data is uh, one for me and one for you, best for me and worst for you, and original for me and copy for you, and in at least one instance, half for me and half for you. Um, he was covering his tracks by processing collections down to the item level to make it appear like nothing was missing. Um, he also was having staff remove duplicates and non-related materials and turning them over to him. And rare and valuable materials were removed and copied. Um, we haven't found some of those materials again. Uh, he was also skimming materials from undocumented or unprocessed or poorly processed collections and from recent donations, things that had walked in the door. You know, he would check them in. He would never do a full inventory. So he was essentially free to take things out before he took the material to the collections committee. Um, we found that there were pages even removed out of publications. And in some cases, we know of entire collections that just walked out the door. Um, he also, and this was his downfall because he thought we were all stupid and didn't know how to do our jobs, he started skimming materials from collections that were actually very well documented. Now, again, um, I'm not going to go as much into how to deter theft. But like I said, do that, get that handout um, from Aaron. It's really helpful. Um, it has a ton of information in it. And inside of it, I've also included a link to the museum's collections management policy because in this document is where you'll find a lot of the policies and procedures that we instituted, instituted after the fact in order to try and deter um, thefts from occurring again in the future. 
Um, because the, one of the best things that you can do to deter theft is establish that broad system of checks and balances, and that's both policies and procedures, and you need to make sure that they are enforced for everyone in the organization from the top to the bottom. Um, the second thing that you need to do um, when it comes to deterring theft is guard your trust. Never, ever place full oversight of the collection in the hands of a single individual. And certainly don't ever restrict um, physical access to a single person. You also need to con conduct um, expanded background checks on staff, volunteers, interns, your researchers, consulting curators who come in, anybody who works with collections. Um, you might also consider... Um, conducting credit checks on newly hired employees. Um, and this is something we learned, thank you Travis, uh, that our thief had actually declared bankruptcy shortly before he acquired his new position at the Mariner's Museum. Um, and then also there is, you could consider joining PACER, which is public access to court electronic records, which will provide, give you the ability to search case and docket information in the federal court system. So it doesn't hurt to just, you know, Google somebody's name and see what comes up. And the last thing that you'd really need to do for deterring theft is really watch for those red flags. Watch for people who are not following procedures, um, if people are perusing storage areas for no reasons, and if a red flag is raised, do not just brush it off and think that you are um, just not being trusting. Um, so the next thing I'm going to try and talk about, and I'm sorry I'm racing through this, but I know I don't have a ton of time. Um, this piece is going to be called um, Things Nobody Tells You and Things You Don't Want to Hear. Um, and the first thing is that no institution is immune to internal theft. Staff members who are familiar with institutional policies and procedures can always, always find ways to circumvent them. And you may not be able to prevent it, but we like to think that you can create your very own Princess Bride fire swamp in order to deter it. Um, and it also doesn't hurt if your staff knows that you will hunt them to the ends of the earth if they steal anything. The, uh, the next thing that I really need to tell you, and I fight with our archivists about this all the time, you need to do your job, you need to do it well, and you need to do it thoroughly, no matter how long it takes, because what you are actually doing is stockpiling evidence in case um, you do suddenly suffer a theft. If you do suffer a theft, do not ignore it. If you suspect an employee is stealing, you need to do everything that you can to catch them because inaction on your part means that another organization becomes a victim. We learned um, during the course of our investigation that several of the museums that our former archivist, Lester F. Weber, worked at suspected that he was stealing from their, their collections and they did not do anything to stop him. They just let him go when he found a new job. And who suffered? We suffered from that. And so it became our mission to make sure that he never did that to another organization on the face of the earth. And I think we were very successful in that. <laughs> um, if you think you have a theft, you need to act quickly and you need to involve the authorities right away. You also need to secure as much evidence and information as you can. You need to secure the thief's office, his computer. You need to scour your files for finding aids, inventories, old collection records. It helps if you gather handwriting samples from staff and collectors. And if eBay is involved, you need to download every eBay sale that you can find and you need to store them electronically. Um, you can also use the eBay feedback profile to identify sales and the buyers who purchased materials. You may not know their name, but you can get a message to them because we, 12 years later, are still sending messages to our buyers um, as we work to get the materials back to the museum. 
Uh, something else that you need to know, and, and this one is not going to be a surprise, is that suffering a theft um, is absolutely emotionally devastating for the staff of the organization, especially the people who are responsible for the collections that have, um, have lost materials. And the trick that you need to, to understand is that you have to take the tears and the incredulity and the frustration and the guilt and the intense anger, and you have to harness it into a vindictive investigating machine. <laughs> you also need to try and be as open as possible with your staff and do not limit their involvement in this. This was one of the biggest mistakes that we made. We listened to the lawyers, they clamped down and they were quiet about what was going on and what it ended up doing was delaying um, finding the evidence that was used to convict our thief for about four months, um, which allowed him to get rid of a lot of materials in that time. It also, because nobody was being verbal about anything, it allowed people to form their own opinion about the situation and it never looks good for the institution, unfortunately. Um, you also need to not be afraid of any publicity that comes out because it can actually provide additional evidence. And you need to make sure that you maintain a record of that publicity and you, the best thing you can do is create a timeline of events as they are occurring because inevitably you're going to have to refer back to, well, when did this happen and when did that happen and when did we find this and when did we do that? Uh, because you're going to need that information as you're going through your court cases or as you're going through your insurance case. Um, you also need to find what we term the bus driver. Um, and the bus driver is the person who's the best suited for the task of investigating. And it's not necessarily the people who are responsible for the day-to-day -day care of the collection. Um, in our particular um, instance, it happened to be me. I was the, I'm the director of collections management and I was head of the collections committee. Um, and it just, I'm the one who kind of said, okay, we're doing this, everybody get behind me um, and I'm gonna take you for a ride. Um, it needs to be someone systematic and organized and determined, someone who's not gonna leave any rock, rocks unturned uh, it needs to be someone who's comfortable with manipulating very, very large um, databases of information and images, and it does not help if, uh, or it doesn't hurt if that person is really vindictive. Um, you need to be prepared to spend a huge amount of time working on this. Um, in my case alone, I've invested about five to 10,000 hours since this all began in 2006. And we had, at, at times, as many as 10 to 15 people working on this at the same time. Um, it's very, very expensive, and you need to learn to love your lawyer. If you don't like him in the beginning, find a new one fast. Uh, because it's going to be very expensive and you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. Um, I was very lucky. The museum's lawyer is a wonderful person who hugged and kissed me and made me stop crying all the time. So uh, you also need to be prepared to deal with more than just the theft investigation. You're going to have to be dealing with unemployment hearings, dueling civil lawsuits, multiple insurance companies, we were juggling three, um, and then the effort to get your materials back. Uh, and then one of the things that, that I always tell people, and my friend Greg Horner in the FBI always rolls his eyes as I say this, um, is working with federal authorities is not easy. You need to be proactive. Don't wait for um, whoever it is you're working with to tell you what to do. And you also need to understand, and you can't expect them to know how to investigate in a cultural institution. Um, they might not necessarily have ever run up against that sort of situation before. Uh, you need to also understand that no matter how quickly you work, the federal justice system does not. 
the defendant has the right to a speedy trial. The victim doesn't. Um, it was 16 months in between notifying the, the authorities and the indictment and another 10 months before the sentencing occurred. Uh, we were asked also to complete huge amounts of work in little or no time. And I know people in museums and archives are used to working that. But, you know, our, the, the U.S. attorney that we were working with would say, I need you to put a fair market value on all of these items and I need you to do it by Tuesday, please. So just be prepared. Um, and this is a... This hint that I'm going to give you is, is investigating, and it's a real detail-oriented thing, but it, it ended up saving us in the end. If the federal authorities or the state authorities or whoever it is that you're working with asks you to review seized evidence, you need to make sure that you do it under bright, raking light. Uh, we were put in a dark room with 500 pieces and asked to look at them all and tell us what belongs to the museum. Well, we did that and we came up with three items, three whopping items. It was horrible. Well, a later review under bright raking light changed that number to 128 pieces. So the evidence was there. We just couldn't see it. Um, it helps also if you build a database of the marks that you're finding on stolen materials because that will really help you to figure out what parts of your collection have been affected the most. And if you're asked to review images, um, it's best if a single person does it, probably your bus driver. Um, we were asked to review almost 4,000 images that ranged in size from a postage stamp up to big, giant, high-res files. And in the end, it ended up being only about 980 objects. But you never would have known that if we had had 15 people looking at images. Um, and it just makes it easier to identify duplicates or um, images that are related to each other. Um, and finally, um, if you know that, that eBay is the situation, is where a lot of the materials have been dispersed from, you need to try and make sure that you alert the buyers as quickly as possible. And you also need to remember that the buyers are also victims. Um, you have to console them and you have to give them whatever assistance you can. We have actually created documents as we go through our returns that help people understand what forms of recourse they have, and that includes contacting eBay um, to try and get their money back because eBay has been reimbursing some of our buyers. Um, they have a policy that you cannot still sell stolen items on their site, and when that policy is broken, um, they're the ones who end up um, bearing the brunt of it. Um, let me see what else is there. I think that's about it. Um, I think that one of the biggest lessons that we've learned, especially with, uh, with regards to the buyers themselves, is that you can't lose your faith in people, but not everybody is going to return the items. People, unfortunately, are perfectly happy knowing that they're holding stolen materials. Um, and they won't be nice about returning the materials. That is offset, however, by the people who go out of the way to send materials back, send you extra materials to help rebuild your collection, or in our situation, and from, thanks to a wonderful man in Switzerland, who, as a matter of fact, was not the guy who turned him in, uh, Lester Inn, um, a man who had already gotten rid of two of the pieces that he had purchased, who actually went out and found duplicates of the items, purchased them, and is returning those to the museum. So um, work with the buyers, um, and, and they will work with you, and just do everything that you can to, you know, to, to assist them, which is not something, you know, part of the, the theft process that people normally see. Um, and then the last thing that I have to say is just one um, bit of warning. Um, if you think your insurance company is going just to bow down and hand you a check for the materials, um, they're not. It's going to be a battle. 
Um, like I said, it took us four years, and we did not get full restitution, but we got enough to help, you know, pay our lawyer expenses and all of that. So um, if anybody has questions, when you get that handout, um, please feel free to email me or call me. Um, I'm happy to help anybody if you, you know, have a situation that you don't know how to deal with. Um, if you're interested, you can get on Google and just Google Mariner's Museum Theft and blog, and you'll see some of kind of the running commentary that we've been providing as we go through this process. And I hope you guys have a good evening. Thank you, Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> So, whoa, that's a tough act <laughs> to follow, and not one that I'd want to. Um, first, let me just talk about some examples of thefts that we've been subjected to at the Rare Book. Um, in the early 1990s, we had a graduate assistant cut paintings out of frames, slid them under fire exits to the outer hallway, and then after would leave RBML because there was only one way in and one way out, and go retrieve them, make Mary off. And then at another point in time, we had a different student steal a rare book while employed. And a guilty conscience prompted him to send it back 20 years later. This was recent. In the mid-1990s, Lee Israel, which probably rings some bells, uh, a self-proclaimed scholar, came into RBML and consistently requested the same catalog correspondence, Hemingway, Steinbeck, and other modern authors which in and of itself is sort of a red flag when it's the same boxes, the same folders. Um, she would request photocopies of these letters and then create forgeries. Then come back, request them again, and replace the originals with the forgeries. She was eventually caught at the New York Public. Most notorious, I think, of the thefts that we've had was Daniel Spiegelman. He cased out Butler Library for months, which was under construction, noting various stairways, halls, stacks, generally the entire layout of the building. He would actually listen from an outer stack to the inner goings on of the RBML, where people were walking. Um, and then he figured out how to gain entrance into the stacks. He used a dumbwaiter long thought to be sealed off by staff, clearly not, but no one would have guessed someone would be climbing up and down in the dumbwaiter in the middle of the night. Once inside the stacks, he actually then continued to dismantle walls with a screwdriver, go in, steal, come out, reassemble the wall, back down the dumbwaiter, and this was over months, because once wasn't enough. You can't carry enough. So from late 1993 to early 1994, he managed to steal an absolutely astounding number of rare materials with an approximate market value of 1.8 million. Again, and, I, and when she said that with insurance, with 1.8 million, it sort of strikes a chord, because this case in particular, and I think other cases as well, it's not like you rob a bank and you're taking 1.8 million, which you could replace with 1.8 million. These are cultural artifacts which should be recognized as such. They're irreplaceable, in essence. And so, um, he, 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 and he didn't know much about rare books at all. He took the opportunistic route and chose the pretty ones. So, of course, illuminated manuscripts appealed the George Plimpton collection was hard hit. Most of these items had descriptions. It used to be they would put descriptions in the, the front of the book or the manuscript that would give provenance and um, exactly what it was. Many of these things weren't, they're not in English either. So it would tell, unfortunately, while informative, tell someone who's not so 
well, well read and knowledgeable about these things, what exactly they were looking at. And so he got a great, great thing there and made off with things that he would have never touched had he not known that these items were in there. Um, he also stole Edison materials, Steinbeck books. He took a razor to the Blau Atlas, cutting out uh, most of the maps, and they still remain missing to this day. So, so do many of the other materials as well. Um, Consuelo Duchki was the medieval curator at the time, and still is to this day. She found out that a medieval manuscript was missing when she went to look for it and wasn't there. Thinking something, well, maybe I misplaced it. Well, no. She was actually asked, do you think you took it home by accident? No. Went back in, looked again, no. Then continued down the line and found more and more medieval manuscripts missing. Um, that said, I just want to touch on some other notable thefts that I think will ring bells, not at RBML, but around the world. In the early 1990s, Stephen Bloomberg was arrested and convicted of the theft for nearly 25,000 titles over a 20-year period from more than 300 US libraries. And in 1991, he was sentenced to five years and 11 months in jail. Interestingly, in 1994, a member of the RBMS committee sent out a survey to 300 libraries that had been hit by Bloomberg. As Susan Allen reports in her article, Preventing Theft in Academic Libraries and Special Collections, in 1997, of the surveys actually returned, 77% of the libraries did not know a theft occurred until they were contacted by police. In 1987, Anthony Melnikus, who was an Ohio State University art professor, cut out pages of books held at the Vatican. He was well known at the Vatican and a friend of the director and used his personal and professional connections to gain the trust he established to commit these thefts. He was caught in 95 and sentenced to 14 months in jail. 2001, Benjamin Johnson, arrested for stealing $2 million worth of rare books and historic documents from Yale's Beinecke, where he held a summer job. He didn't attend Yale, but a college in Wisconsin, and he was caught after a dealer in autographs became suspicious of a student selling rare items out of his dorm room and called police, sentenced to 15 months in jail. Yale apparently had no knowledge of these thefts until they were contacted by police. Then there's Edward Forbes Smiley, highly regarded and respected map collector. He ingratiated himself with major libraries by donating maps to their collection, all the while cutting rare maps out of the books in those collections. He was caught at Yale's Beinecke when a library saw an X-Acto knife on the floor that he apparently dropped. Pleaded guilty June 2006, three and a half years in jail. More recently, Marino M. DeCaro, director of the State Library in, State library in Naples, Italy, looted the library of an estimated 2,200 books and destroyed its card catalog in an attempt to cover it up. He even created forgeries of Galileo books stole the originals from other libraries, and then sold the forgeries to dealers, some of which suffered the consequences here in New York City. In March 2013, he was sentenced to seven years in prison, although as I understand it, he still remains in his home, living rather nicely. In June 2012, Barry Landau, sentenced to seven years federal prison for the theft of thousands of historical documents, Lando and his cohort stole from various historical societies and special collections. He developed protocols to distract curators while these items were being stolen and admitted concealing documents in cl inside clothing that had been modified to contain hidden pockets. They also removed library card catalog entries, making it more difficult for staff to know something was missing. They were caught at the Maryland Historical Society. When curators became suspicious, called police, who found 79 documents in a computer bag located in a museum locker of which Landau's partner held the key. His partner was sentenced to one year and one day in jail. I think it's safe to say that most special collections at libraries have at some point been the victim of theft, either as an inside or outside job. While it is easier to protect collections from outside theft, there really is no clear solution to preventing inside theft. 
At Columbia, we implemented alarm systems and swipe cards after the Spiegelman theft. As in most cases, these measures for security were reactionary. We all face the dilemma of balancing access and research, performing our job functions as librarians, and still offering security. In an interesting article Dan Traster wrote, he speaks about insider theft at UPenn. He cites a student that had been working at the library from 1981 to 1990 until she was arrested. Traster didn't hire her, she was there when he took the job, and the thief was a student assistant who was, whose status was never checked. Supposedly a doctoral candidate, she had abandoned her studies previously but never reported it because she would have lost her ability to continue working. She was caught when she went above and beyond and stole a Shakespeare quarto, sure to be found missing, and a book dealer, although a book dealer was the one who caught it and contacted UPenn. One of the most valuable points I think Traster makes is that insider theft is virtually impossible to stop, and I hate to use that word impossible, but given what I've read, Traster even states that he had, had the student in question applied for the job, he would have hired her himself, as she presented no red flags and presented herself well. The most important thing a library can do is be transparent when a theft does occur. Back in the 1990s, institutions feared public going public with thefts, donor relations were thought to be negatively affected, and the individuals who actually reported the theft were afraid they would be considered the thief themselves. This practice has thankfully changed. At Columbia, after Spiegelman hit, Consuelo, who initially discovered this theft, was thought to be the perpetrator. Until over the course of many months, it came to light that medieval manuscripts were not the only items stolen. She told me it was the worst feeling she has ever experienced. And speaking to other staff who was there during this time, they actually, a few teared up when I asked them about this incident. It was so horrible for staff morale. Everyone looked at everyone else as a thief. No one, no one knew what to believe because as simplicity says, the person who found it, no one, the guy was climbing through a dumbwaiter, dismantling walls. No one, so of course, by all intent and purposes, you're gonna think it's someone who works there. So it created an, a nasty environment, and at the time, Columbia did not want them to go public with this theft. And they basically fought on this front quite a bit, and eventually, and thank God, uh, an inventory was taken, and they contacted police, FBI, and most importantly, dealers across the world. And that's how Spiegelman was caught in the Netherlands, by trying to sell stolen manuscripts. What he did was, he not only was trying to sell, he, was, he contacted a medieval dealer in the Netherlands, brought him medieval documents, but included with it George Washington letters. So the dealer, wait a minute, why, are you, why do you have Washington letters in the net? So there it goes. He got suspicious, called someone else in the States, and said, wait a minute, that rings bells, and there we go. So that's what, what hit off that, that catch. And he, he was sentenced to 60 months in prison, which at the time was an upward departure in sentencing guidelines. Three years supervised release and 300 hours of community service, which quite frankly, I find egregious. Not only that, but when he got out, part of the deal was that he would return all the stolen items, which he had stashed all over Manhattan in post off boxes and all the rest of it. And he returned some, but then when he got out of jail, went up to Greenwich and tried to sell more. So there's a variety of online databases for cultural property, including rare books that are used to catch thieves. Several different databases with varying contents. There's Interpol, the France-based International Police Agency that has a database. London Scotland Yard has one. The FBI has a national stolen art file, but only inclu includes cases within the U.S. federal jurisdiction. There are databases maintained by ILAB, the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers, the ABAA, Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. But there doesn't seem to be a one-stop shop for this. Um, so with so many databases, stolen items reported and or found become somewhat of a nightmare to navigate. 
And as she had said, you can look up court cases or federal cases that have gone on before, but if they haven't committed any act previously, then nothing is going to set it off. So that's another problem. At Columbia, we have many student workers, and without them, quite frankly, we couldn't function. We have policies that apply to students, we have policies that apply to staff, and they're generally the same. For example, no bags in the reading rooms or the stacks for any reason whatsoever. Um, I think it puts an undue burden, unfortunately, on students because if something does arise, they should know that they could be considered a thief. And that's not a great position to be put into. Um, Again, service demands, that undermines surveillance. I know we're inundated on a daily basis with researchers. Bibliographic controls of rare materials are entered daily, but as most institutions, I, I think I speak for most, we have a backlog. And funding and staff, they're, they're limited. Collections are so large that few libraries do systematic inventories given the amount of human time they require. An article in the Washington Post from 2007 highlights the fact that the Library of Congress had 13% of its collection missing and unaccounted for. While not necessarily stolen, you can imagine this caused quite an upset. There was a congressional hearing. Since 2002, the Library of Congress has been conducting an inventory, prompted in part by a series of thefts there in the 1990s. However, at the time this article was written, the inventory was 20% complete. So let me add that bibliographic control is a great method of preventing theft, especially outside theft. That said, even if every item were cataloged, an employee would have access to erase the record. So this will not definitively prevent the theft. Marking books, installing microchips, they're all listed on the Association of College and Research Libraries RBMS guidelines as a way of security control. While I agree to a certain extent for outside theft, if there's a chip, it sets off an alarm, that's a problem, it, but it's another overwhelming task and an impossible one for archival collections. You cannot tag every piece of paper. In a, I, I work for the Carnegie collections, thousands and thousands of linear feet of paper. That's just not feasible. Again, so even if we did microchip every just book in our collection, an employee would know it's microchipped, and I would hope unless they're stupid and then we would get them, would remove it. So that's unfortunate about that. So one of the best things we did at Columbia was implement a system called Aon, and I don't know if anyone else here is at an institution that uses it. Instead of handwritten call slips, and registration cards, our system, all electronic. Patrons have their picture taken, all transactions are electronically documented, and this creates a built-in timestamp for items used in and out which cannot be altered. We also have an off-site facility in Princeton to house both manuscript collections and books with all items barcoded. This serves to make missing items more noticeable and then easier to identify. The question remains, are we too trusting of our colleagues? There must be a certain level of trust among employees or we really could not perform our job functions. And the environment would prove so hostile as to create an atmosphere where one may want to steal. <laughs> Behavioral scientists and psychologists have long contended that trust is one of the most powerful forces within any organization because it promotes coherent and cohesive workforce. All the same, it instills great loyalty and behalf on the behalf of employees to its organization. At Columbia, I feel all staff make a point to interact and communicate with each other regularly. I know I speak to my direct manager daily, and should my behavior change, I'm fairly certain she would notice and vice versa. We can and do everything within our power and budget as librarians to deter and mitigate potential, potential theft, but can never be 100% safe. And just to comment on the last, that, that just, that was horrible, what they went through. Um, 
the way he renumbered and got access to these collections, I mean, I know one of my colleagues is an archivist here, Susan Klein, who does a fabulous job. And we get these tremendous collections in, but I have to say, while there's, you're not looked over like this all day, you couldn't function, I, there's reporting structures in line. There's inventories that are taken as soon as that material comes in. So that if something really, really go, there's no way I've reprocessed collections that have been there. And if I started with crazy number schemes and, and cutting off certain people from seeing anything, moving things around, rearranging and creating artificial collections out of a collection that was, th there would be some serious flags going on. I, I, I don't know that, I don't, I, as a matter of fact, 100% sure that that would not fly. So, that's it. safe distance. I have a loud voice. I don't want to knock everyone out of their chairs. Um, one of the things that um, uh, Jean didn't mention uh, in the Mariner's Museum um, bit, uh, probably because there's just so much there, um, was, uh, well, two things. First, she may be a little self-deprecating and humble, but the Mariner's Museum responded as well as any institution could to a theft like that. They ought to be patted on the back. Uh, they ought to be held up as an example, despite, as she mentioned, some of the things that that uh, that they did wrong, because there is no script. Um, uh, they, when it seemed like the prosecution, the federal prosecution was lagging, and as she mentioned, that's just part of the prosecution. That's just part of the process at the federal level. Um, they went after this guy in civil court. Lester Weber is among the most malevolent, maybe the maybe the most malevolent, which is which is interesting given the the um, number of characters in this field. Uh, of, of these thieves. He was just a bad guy all around, uncooperative, probably stealing from them right from the begin beginning, probably had designs to do so right from the beginning. Um, and as, as Jean said, uh, it helps to be vindictive, and they really went after him. They went after him in civil court. Almost no one ever does that. Almost everyone, um, uh, every institution, if they're not covering it up, let the police and the attorneys uh, handle it. Um, but the Mariners Museum, while also doing that, got their pound of flesh. So. They ought to be applauded for that. Um, if you're a fan of getting your pound of flesh, I you know. Um, the other interesting note about that that sh that that is sort of the lead of the story that that I don't th I don't think I flipped through the 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 hand up there and I don't think it was in there. The way this guy in uh, in Switzerland caught Lester Weber. So his wife Lori Childs was uh, the the uh, the distribution specialist. She's the one who sent the stuff out and made the money. He was just the guy who acquired it, of course. And so on this eBay account, which was in her name, um, her last name is different than his, which, which actually factored in, um, um, she sent out things. And she would, uh, on a return address, say, Lori Childs, Newport News, Virginia, you know, whatever the address was. And um, this guy in Switzerland had bought a number of things from them and, and sort of wondered how, how this Lori Childs person got all these really fantastic things. But he Googled and couldn't find anything. Um, this was 2005, 2006, couldn't find anything uh, that, that, that helped him out. One day, she included her middle initial, Lori E. Childs, and he Googled that, and that made all the difference, because Lori E. Childs was uh, found out through an article, an obituary of her mother in the Woodland County Democrat, a, news, a small newspaper in California where she was from. Lori E. Childs was said to be a survivor of this lady who died and was married to Lester Weber of Newport News, Virginia. So now this guy in Switzerland had Lester Weber's name, and that took about five seconds for him to Google and find out that he worked for the Mariners Museum, and that was the end of their story. Um, I love that little detail that, that Lori Childs didn't mean anything, but Lori E. Childs, this tiny, tiny, tiny little seemingly insignificant thing that she didn't even think about but included on the return address uh, spelled the end of them. So, um, so what I wanted to talk about, um, was uh, several things. Well, let's start with uh, what an insider is. Um, it's sort of a continuum. It seems like an insider versus an outsider would be sort of a bright line thing, a black and white thing. But as with most polls, um, there is a significant gray area um, 
in the middle. So on the, on the outsider side, we have, say, Daniel Spiegelman, for instance, a man who had probably no affiliation with Columbia University at all. He was allowed into the Butler Library because he stole a student ID and then put his picture on it. He was an accomplished forger. That's where he'd originally spent time in prison. Um, uh, so he didn't know anyone at Columbia that we know of. His mom, he lived with his mom. Um, his mom wasn't affiliated with Columbia. He was, uh, he was from the Ukraine. He, he came here as a teenager. Um, uh, and so he was a complete and utter outsider. And the way he got in was this was the a way, uh, the way an outsider would is through this dumb waiter shaft. On the other hand, you have uh, someone like Lester Weber, who was in many ways the sort of quintessential insider. Not only did he get a paycheck from the Mariners Museum, but he was the direct, eventually the director of archives, and as John said, he spent a lot of time reorganizing, right? He, he pretty much had his hand in everything and could and did destroy records, right? So this is a man who was basically all powerful in the things that he could do to the, to the things over which he, he had uh, dominion. Um, but between those two areas, uh, you have a lot of you have a lot of gray area, including Barry Landau, who was who was mentioned. Now, Barry Landau wasn't affiliated with any of the uh, universities or the Maryland Historical Society, many of the historical societies that he uh, stole from as an employee. That is, he didn't draw a paycheck from any of them, but he spent a lot of time there, right? Um, and so, one of the things we see with guys like Landau is that they spend a lot of time ingratiating themselves with the archivists or librarians. Um, they do this either through flattery or through uh, confectionery. They bring cookies, um, and Landau was, was, I met people who've eaten his cookies. Um, um, uh, Landau was famous for this, and he would go in and, and sort of tell people how great it, it, their collection is, and, and, and he would bring them things and, and spend a lot of time there. And over time, as naturally happens if, if you are in special collections or archives or in libraries at all, or have spent a, a, an appreciable amount of time there, you earn a sort of trust, right? And people tend to think you're okay. Um, uh, the Library of Congress, another example of this, was a man named Charles Merrill Mount, who was a, an art historian uh, who wrote a couple of, of books. He was a John Singer sergeant um, uh, specialist. And uh, he wrote these books in the 1970s using sources from the Library of Congress and continued at the Library of Congress into the 1980s um, working in, um, um, in the reading room and in archives. Uh, and he was basically given staff level access, although he didn't officially work for um, the LLC, of course, he was given this really fantastic access. He was allowed to leave because they had security at the Library of Congress, of course, but staff members would tell security guards, this guy's okay, he's basically one of us, and he left with you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of um, archives. Um, so these guys are sort of pseudo-insiders. Pseudo they're not insiders because they don't draw a check. They don't actually, they aren't actually employed there, but they are sort of in this, in this gray area. Um, um, and it, this is it's worth, worth thinking about when we think about um, how to prevent um, insider theft. Um, so let's get to what the motivation is for these sorts of crimes. Now the motivation for most property crimes, as you can probably guess, is of course money, right? People don't steal a thousand television sets because they have a thousand rooms. They steal them so that they can turn them into cash, right? Uh, and that's generally why people steal books and it's generally why people steal archival material, right? They want money. But what's the other major reason people steal these things that doesn't accrue to other property crimes? Well, that's an interesting one I wasn't going to touch on. Change the historical record. Yes, that's right. Uh, maybe uh, steal something in a, some sort of archival material that might, uh, um, that might, that might look uh, uh, differently than what you want it to look at. Uh, we think of Sandy Berger. I don't know. Okay, Sandy Berger was the, uh, Bill Clinton's national security advisor um, and broke into the, or oh, didn't break in. He was in the National Archives and stole a number of things that, that he thought would be inconvenient to his testimony before Congress. Um, and he was caught red-handed, um, red-socked. He was stuffing them in his socks. Um, yeah, what else? Why do people steal books if not to sell them? Collectors. Collectors. People who, who um, love these things so much that they have to have them on their shelves, right? Same reason people would steal archival material. If, you know, it's got an Abraham Lincoln signature, signature George Washington signature, whatever. You want to frame it and put it on your wall. Um, this is something that doesn't... Uh, occur a whole lot in other crimes, but occurs uh, with some regularity in, in uh, rare book theft and, and archival theft, uh, though not as regularly as popular culture would have us think, you know, the whole bibliomania thing. Everyone who gets caught stealing these things always says that, that he really loved books too much when what he loved was, of course, money. 
Um, is the motivation different between insiders and outsiders, right? Finally, let's get to something that might be helpful. Do the insiders who steal from their own collections have a different impulse than the outsiders? Now, one of the things that complicates this whole, th this whole uh, idea of, of, of um, why people steal is because um, we don't, in fact, know the percentage of people who steal for money versus the percentage of people who steal for, um, to collect or to change history or for revenge or a variety of things. And the reason we don't know the percentage, we can't make an accurate percentage, Any, anyone guess what the reason is that we can't tell? Basically, the only way we catch these guys is when they're, when they're selling it, okay? So basically, not exclusively, but basically, most of the people that we catch are people who are, by definition, trying to make money. So we don't catch a lot of the collectors, right? They get away with it. They get away with it, they stick things on their shelves, they stick things on their wall, and when they die, their children try to sell it at Sotheby's, and that's when we find out. Or their children donate it to the New York Public Library, and that's when we find out sometimes. Um, not always then. Which is another interesting thing about this. I was in Tiffany the other day because I'm a hayseed from Illinois, and when you come to, Illinois, or when you come to New York City, you gotta go to Fifth Avenue and go into Tiffany, right? So I was in Tiffany, and um, I was looking at, at, at expensive things. And there was no chance, that is a zero chance, that I could take a pair of earrings from one of the collections and make it to the, this was on the third floor, make it to the first floor without getting tackled or tasered or punched or whatever. Right? Someone was going to catch me and I was going to be filmed, right? So when you try to steal from Tiffany, when you try to steal from an electronic store, when you try to steal from Walmart, when you try to steal from almost anywhere, the way you are caught, of course, is in the commission of the act. But when you steal from a library or archive, you are almost never caught in the commission of an act, of the act, right? Um, there are a few examples of that. Barry Landau, of course, was caught by the Maryland Historical Society in the commission of the act. But basically, you're only caught in the selling part. So that um, makes it more complicated when we're trying to figure out uh, um, who, who's doing all of the stealing, because basically the only ones we catch are the ones who are, who are in it for the money. Nevertheless, we can sort of extrapolate, um, um, or I can, because I've read so many of these different cases. Um, and it seems to me that the people who are insider thieves steal for money more than for collecting at a rate very much higher than outsiders, right? And why would that be? Well, I, I'm the curator of a lot of rare books, and I don't need to steal anything from my collection because I have access to it anytime I want. I don't need to put it on my shelf. It's basically on my shelf. It's, it's 100 yards, not 100 yards, 100 feet from where I sit every day. And if I want to look at these things, I can go look at them. I don't need to steal them to put them on my shelf. It's not the only reason I don't steal from my own collection, but, um, um, but, but people who steward collections have access to these collections, right? They have access to them whenever they want. They don't need to steal from these. That, 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 that's one reason I posit. The other thing um, is the, the insider thieves that we talk about, the, um, uh, the Daniel Lorellos of the world who, who was uh, from upstate stealing uh, from the national uh, or the, the state archives in Albany. Um, um, the um, David Breithaupts, who worked at Kenyon College for 10 years and was stealing from, uh, from Ken the Kenyon College general collection, special collections, and, and, uh, and archives. Skeet Willingham, who was, uh, who was a, a gentleman who uh, um, worked at the University of Georgia, was the director of special collections there and was stealing from his own collection. And of course, Lester Weber. They all had money problems, right? Lester Weber declared bankruptcy a month and a half before he got to Newport News. Um, um, Daniel Lorello was basically paying bills. I've seen David Breithaupt's bank statements, and this guy, over the course of, of five or six years, um, deposited something on the order of $700,000 in his bank account, and he, he had about zero when he was caught. Much of it went into his, um, he was addicted to pills, so much of it uh, went into buying um, um, drugs, and much of it went into repairing his furnace, making car payment, paying for his house, all these sorts of things. Um, he was flat broke, and he was constantly borrowing money from people, and that's why he was stealing. Now, he probably, he was a pretty terrible guy and, and would have stolen anyway, um, um, but, but uh, the people that we find who are insider thieves are, are basically stealing for money. Now, is that helpful? Is that helpful to us um, in, in, in uh, trying to come up with a solution? I don't know. I don't know if it's helpful or not. It's good to know. Um, um, because the more knowledge we have, uh, uh, the more helpful it can be. I tend to agree uh, with Jennifer, with Jean, with Dan Traster, that there's very little we can do to prevent 
outsider theft. There's a great deal we can do to prevent insider theft, of course. Um, though, again, as alluded to, one of the problems with preventing insider theft, is, or I'm sorry, outsider theft, is um, you, you uh, put up walls between the patrons and the material, and we're here to give the material to the patrons. So, uh, so that's one of the, the downsides of, of a lot of security. Um, uh, but as John said, um, you know, we could, we could uh, build it with the fire swamp from, from, um, um, from uh, uh, the Princess Bride. But the second thing she said I think is actually more helpful uh, and more in line with, with what, I would, uh, what I would be in favor of. Uh, and that's instilling in your staff the fact that you're going to go after them and follow them to the ends of the earth uh, and prosecute them to the fullest extent. Now, um, certainty of jail time certainty of punishment and severity of jail time, severity of punishment are two different things, but they're both related. I think everyone here can agree that the certainty of punishment uh, is the sort of, sort of thing that would discourage an insider, right? There's almost nothing we can set up that's going to prevent insider theft, right? Sooner or later, someone who really wants to get something is going to get that something. There's no, almost nothing we can do about it without making it difficult to work at the place, as Jennifer suggested. But we can make it certain that if you get caught, and if you sell these things, you will eventually get caught, that you are going to spend time in prison, maybe state prison, which is worse. One of the things that we talk about um, now is overcrowded prisons. Um, the state of California has been ordered by the Supreme Court to get rid of a lot of people that are in their prisons. And we can talk about, um, we can have a philosophical discussion about uh, over penalization, putting people in jail, warehousing people for, for fairly minor crimes because we can't think of what else to do with them. That is not any part of this discussion because let me tell you what, the state penal institutions of this country are not overcrowded with cultural heritage thieves. Okay. <laughs> that is not a problem that we have. In fact, what happens is these guys are severely underpunished. And at the state level, they're, um, they're, they're ridiculously underpunished. The federal level has, in the past 10 years, um, done a pretty good job of, of punishing these guys. The difficult thing, of course, is getting something raised to the level of a federal crime, which I won't go into the, the machinations behind that. Um, but once you get uh, something elevated to the level of a federal crime, uh, it's punished under something called the cultural, usually punished under something called the Cultural Heritage Resources Guideline, which was this thing implemented about 10 years ago um, at the federal level, which is part of the federal sentencing guidelines. Um, and I won't go uh, deeply into the federal sentencing guidelines. But what it does is it punishes these crimes more severely than ordinary property crimes. So at the federal level, if you, you know, if you were stealing a bunch of copper wire or Audis or television sets or, or regular property, you would get sentenced at this level. And if you were st stealing something called a cultural heritage resource item, you would get sentenced at this level, right? Which is fantastic. Um, and these levels add up um, and all of the, including Barry Landau who got the seven years, which is really one of the great uh, sentences for, the best sentence for, for, any, of these, for any of these guys. Um, uh, this is all thanks to the federal sentencing um, this cultural heritage resource guideline in the federal sentencing guideline. Uh, and so if we can instill in the people that work for us that not only are you going to get caught if you try to make any money off of this, you might not make any money to begin with, um, but you are going to spend severe time in prison, uh, I think that that's the sort of thing that might have an impact on the Daniel Arellos, the Lester Webers, the Skeet Willinghams, the Barry Landau's of the world. I think these are the sorts of guys that if they knew what they were in for, if they knew that they were in for a seven-year stretch, uh, or even a two-year stretch at state prison, um, that they might uh, think twice about about uh, selling a you know a piece of archival material for twenty five for twenty five bucks or fifty bucks or a hundred bucks or even a thousand bucks. That whatever problems they have, whatever money problems they have, can be overcome or not overcome, but in some other way that doesn't require them or doesn't oblige them to steal our cultural heritage items. Thank you. With a smile and insult and pity for the king, for the princes, for the savants, for Baptisto, and say, mine, this book is mine, and hold it in his two hands all his life to fondle it, touch it, to take it in all its fragrance as he smells it. Now, may, many of you may, um, recognize that passage. It's from Flaubert's first tale, 
called Bibliomania, which is based on a real case of a person who stole a book, a monk, a former monk who became a bookseller, and he had to have the one unique book that existed from the first printer of Spain, and it was printed in 1482, and it was the Edicts of Valencia. So he bid on the book when it came up for sale, and somebody else outbid him. He sold everything. So within a week, the person who was the successful bidder was found dead in a fire. He was, everything was burnt down and there were some books missing. Okay, so this person, this former monk was arrested. This is a true story about Flaubert when he was 14, 15 or 16, depending on your source, uh, wrote the tale about after he read it in the paper with the case. What happened to this poor person is that, say poor, is that his lawyer said, wait a minute, we found another copy in France. And this, this killed him more than the sentence, because he sat there saying, there's another copy, because he wanted the unique copy. Now this is obsession. And there's nothing you can do about this with theft if you are obsessed to steal it and just want to keep it like this fellow did. He was a bookseller. He didn't sell books. He only sold the cheap ones. He had to keep them all. And we know some booksellers like that who have to keep, you know, like Rosenbach was like that. He kept the good stuff. He just couldn't get rid of, like, like Joyce's proofs, galley proofs and things like that. But something, this is something I don't think you could ever, ever stop, ever. Insider, outsider, if you are obsessed with book collecting. And also, or manuscript collecting. Manuscripts even worse, I think. Because in certain in manuscripts, you have a certain mystical or magical feeling or relation with the, with the signature, with the autograph, that this person, George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or whoever, actually touched this and signed it. Which is why you have such a big market in clip signatures, which are worthless. I mean, Abraham Lincoln is probably one of the most forged presidents of all. I mean, you can make the A. Lincoln, and, but the others aren't worth as much. I mean, years ago, I mean, I appraised some of these things. You know, you'd have a Lincoln for 10,000, a clip signature. Now Washington's up to 10,000, Lincoln's even more. So you have this, this type of thing with the obsession with this manuscripts, et cetera. They're not selling them, so it's not money. Now, I, I do teach a course on philosophies of punishment, and, and Travis is speaking like Beccaria here, with uh, celerity of punishment and certainty and severity, which is what he said in the 18th century, and we haven't actually achieved this yet, but I, I, I'm impressed. <laughs> However, the, um, the other thing, and I want to kind of reverse this, because there's nothing to do about obsession. It happens and you just get destroyed by, you get eaten up by obsession. The other thing is, let us, let's talk about theft as the preservation of cultural heritage. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that, take the case, let's go back to Maryland. I went to Maryland many years ago from Chicago, I worked there and spent there many years. So. Um, John Thomas Scarf, who many of you have seen his big fat local history books, which are mostly quotations, the history of Baltimore, history of Maryland, history of Philadelphia, history of everything, always in three, four volumes. Now, Scarf was the commissioner of land patents in, in Maryland. And he was basically unto himself. He took his work home. There was nobody else, there wasn't an archive. He was it. So you had the, the Charles Carroll of Carrollton papers, you had all the colonial records, charters, what have you. Well, when he decides to leave, what does he do? Or well, who's he leaving it to? So he was afraid that this was going to get lost. So what he did was he um, took it all home, he wrote 10,000 pages of local history from it. He took it home and then 
the Johns Hopkins University started, and they were going to be, an, uh, have a, be a center for Southern history and culture. So SCARF actually gave these papers to the Johns Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins then decided they were going to go in another direction and have the center. So what they did is they put it on deposit at the Maryland Historical Society. So when I walked into the Maryland Historical Society after my release from prison, um, I was hit with a Replevin suit, at least the Historical Society was, because they decided they started to professionalize archives. And the state archivist, who actually was a student with me at Johns Hopkins, became the Commissioner of Land Patents and the state archivist. He wanted them all back, all these papers, and they were on deposit at the Maryland Historical Society. So just think of the legal complexities you have there. They're owned by Hopkins, but they were stolen by SCARF, and now they're on deposit by the Maryland Historical Society. And the state archivist wants them, mainly because he's a colonial Maryland historian, and he wants to calendar them. So there was a deal worked out where they would microfill them, which would take forever, et cetera. But here you actually do have somebody who wanted to preserve a cultural heritage so it wouldn't get lost. So he, you know, technically he stole the papers. I mean, I could say the same thing about the Elgin marbles. Lord Elgin bought them fair and square from the Ottoman Empire, and I don't think they'd be around right now if he didn't take them to England. And, and now they're still work talking about you know, trying to get them back into Greece, but I don't think they would have been standing if Lord Elgin didn't take them you know, during the Napoleonic era, era et cetera. Okay, so there you have two different things, and of course it's usually about money. And even when I was, when I was at the Maryland Historical Society, I, was, um, I organized the Manuscript Society meeting way back when. And the first day, a dealer came to me and said, come on over. Would you sell some of these manuscripts to me? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. That's a true story. So I go up. To, OK, so let's leave that one alone, because I wasn't around when Barry Landau, et cetera. But who knows? You never really can tell until somebody asks for the material if it's stolen. So I go over. I leave Maryland, go to come to New York. And I was at the New York Historical Society. My predecessor, who disappeared into Kentucky during a strike, was a cataloger when you had cards, nice, good cards. And I was looking through his office one day, because he just left. He left everything in place. And I picked up some a book that was underneath a bunch of catalog cards. I said, oh, this is interesting. Look at this. This was Nathaniel Morton's uh, New England Memorial, 1669. Um, and if you looked inside the free front end papers, et cetera, you have all these pencil notations. Oh, John Evelyn, who was Secretary of Navy in 17th century UK. His, his signature's there. Oh, a Marshall Lefford's signature's there. Oh, it was sold at the Robert Wholesale. I said, isn't this interesting? Now, the Robert Wholesale was probably the biggest sale for 50 years until the Streeter sale. This was 1911-12. He was the whole press, the printing press family. It was the biggest sale in America, in the world, almost, until the Streeter sale in the 60s. So I said, that's a nice one. Now, the New York Historical Society bought everything they may have been going poorer and poorer during those days, but they had a lot of good funds to buy New York and early Americana. So I got busy and the thing just sat there. And but I said, this is really an interesting association copy because all rare book collectors like to say, oh my God, the Lefferts, Evelyn at Lefferts, ho, et cetera, copy. You know, you'll see that advertised in, in auction catalogs. Two years later, the FBI comes to my door, and they say, have you seen any of this stuff? Now, mind you, this could have been, I could have left that there forever. It was under still a mountain of catalog cards. So um, I said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You mean this one? And this was from the theft insider from the, the Vanderbilt, the Biltmore Library down in North Carolina, where the security guard was stealing, this was in the late 70s, stealing a bunch of books. And nobody's ever, as far as I know, I have not seen a list. They have done an inventory afterwards, which they, make, they won't make uh, public. The security guard sold them 
these books, like Morton, which is very valuable, 50, 60 grand maybe, um, to a book scout. Now, book scouts go around. If you ever want to read a great novel about a book scout, read Larry McMurtry's Cadillac Jack. Cadillac Jack was a book scout. Because McMurtry, the novelist, was a rare book dealer, still is, basically. But he had a book a booked up at Georgetown, was his shop. So he wrote this wonderful book. So the book scout took them, bought them probably at cut rate prices from the security guard. They went around the country and sold them to rare book dealers. Now here's where the rare book dealer, you know, they, they kind of salivate when things like this come into their hands. And they don't ask enough questions. And so then the New York Historical Society bought it for something like $6,500. We're talking about late 70s, a lot of money. And when the FBI then took it away and gave me a receipt, I went back to, the, he was a very respectable book dealer. And he said, oh, it happens, you know, but you know, I should have been, you know, more due diligence, with, and he gave, he refunded the money, which was good, because he was very respectable. And um, until recently, you know, he finally retired and got out of the business. So here you have money, 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 money. I mean, the security guard just grabbed up all these books and sold them, and on and on, you had a number of layers. Okay, so every, almost every institution I've been in, by the way, you see I've had insider theft. And when you talk about changing the record, I could go back even further, because I did... Um, I did a dissertation using medieval charters, and about one third were forged and st stolen because what they had to do was to try to prove that they owned the land from a certain period, like the eighth, ninth century, when it was very dark, literally, in literacy. And so the monks would forge a lot of charters, and then they put them in the archive. They ended up in the Archive Nacional after the, during the revolution. But let's, I won't, I'll leave that alone. So I get over to the Library of Congress after the New York Historical Society. Well, I was at Lehman College too, but I don't know of any thefts there. I look at my old former colleague there. Um, but the Library of Congress, and there are a lot of thefts there. You had a lot of security, but there were more interests. You had a tunnel that went into the Capitol from the uh, Library of Congress. And all the, the Capitol Police were concerned, was concerned about was if you had a gun. Now, you had different levels of security. I had, a, I had top confidential security. Uh, nine months, the FBI investigated me. For, I don't know why. You know, they didn't even ask if I took my work home with me, meaning rare books. But which meant if I had the red little card that I could, nobody would check your back. Down, you had different levels, green, yellow, et cetera, which means everybody had their bag checked. But what happened, you had a big spate of thefts at the Library of Congress, especially cutting out um, plates, plate books like the bird books, Gould and what have you. And dealers would basically be doing that because the stacks were open. They had, finally had to close the stacks. You, Travis talked about the, um, the Charles Merrill Mount, which was you know going on at the same time. There was another fellow in the manuscripts division who had the whole run and would be taking stuff on uh, MD, I forget his name. However, more close to home, I had a number of uh, specialists or curators that I inherited. And one was an Americana specialist. And right at that time, we were going through the big thing about the oath of a freeman, which Hoffman, Mark Hoffman, was trying to sell. He was the, forging all the Mormon letters, and then he killed a couple of people. Well, the, Mer the Library of Congress, as well as the uh, American Antiquarian Society, were, were thinking of buying this for a million dollars. And so Jim Gilreath, who worked for me as Americana specialist, he was part of the team, you know, on and off, should they buy it. But of course, Congress had to give a million dollars, and Congress is sometimes can be uh, pretty cheap about things like one a broadside or a broadsheet. Um, so they didn't do it. And he, Jim, edited the book. Actually, Marcus McCorrison from the American Antiquarian Society was was had the best, I think, the last word on this when he said provenance, provenance, provenance. In other words, where did it come from? Now you can find these things. You go upstate New York, you find caches of. Martin Van Buren letters, because remember, he was upstate New York, and he was the president. 
And they're in family homes that you know, were relating to uh, the certain presidents. But Gilreath was an arrogant person, and, he, and there's something wrong, too, because everybody thought, well, you know, we put up with this because he's smart. And the Library of Congress had a very kind of, to me, it was an invasive, offensive system where everything that went out of the library, the chief, I was chief of a book, had, I had to read it and, and uh, initial it. And so that means letters, publication, anything official. So Jim did one of these things called the, the Indian portfolios, which was George Brazeler did it, and it was a very a bestseller. And it was Catlin, McKinney Hall, and Carl Bodmer's lithographs and equitants, et cetera, of the, um, of the Indians that the, they went from their expeditions. And then I realized, I'm reading this thing just for, I was bored. I usually just signed off. Um, my God, I said, he's describing um, a lithograph as an engraving. And, you know, he's supposed to know better. I mean, and, you know, actually, the, the, two of the three were lithographs of the Indian books. One was Aquitan. And I said, you're supposed to know these printing processes. This is what your job is. You're a specialist. So, you know, I kind of started thinking that something's wrong. Then the man went through a lot of problems with the divorce. He had terrible substance abuse. He was, he was found just laying on the floor drunk half the time. Uh, and I could go on and on. I know we're running out of time, so I won't. This is a wonderful story, which I suppose you could dig up, but I had a deal with the man. I thought he was capable of anything except theft. Now, let me get to, here's the gist of insight of theft. What happens at the Library of Congress and many libraries, we have five, we have five special collections there. So it's not just one special collection. Manuscripts went to manuscripts, rare book went to rare book, unless it came in a special collection. I won't confuse you. So I had medieval manuscripts, whereas manuscript division had um, Americana. So you would get, the, the problem here was the Horace Travel papers, and he was a friend of Walt Whitman. So all the manuscripts from Horace Travel came up from Trenton and went to the manuscripts division, and his large library of Whit Whitman came to Rare Book. So what the specialists did, we had uh, artist books and specialists, and we had uh, Americana specialists and European, uh, boom, boom. So you put them up there, and I think, Travis, you said it there about something else with the catalogers or archivists. The specialist was a selector, because we had first dibs on every book in the Library of Congress. And when they even came in and copied after over $500, I had to go down with the colleague and we'd pick and select. Some were self-published, we didn't like. So you would have 500, 1,000 books from Walt Whitman, some first editions. Now, the, L, the LC Rare Book Division has something like 14 first editions of Leaves of Grass, as well as you know, the famous second edition with Emerson and actually the signature center with Walt Whitman wrote the, on, the, on the spine Emerson's review about how great it was. So what he would do is he would take, again, one for you, one for me. And I know he was selling a lot later on, I knew. He was selling a lot to a bookstore in Washington, I won't name because I can't prove it. So I left and came up here in 95 to do real crime, right? Um, and I think it was about 97 that this all broke where he went to Boston. Now, he was on disability because he was so drunk, he fell in the alley, taken out the garbage, broke his head, and got a lifetime disability check from the Library of Congress. Uh, he was 50 years old at the time. But what he did, which to me was offensive too, because this is a gentle person's trade, right? Um, what he did was he stole two Whitman first editions. I believe they were. And I think they're the French ones, uh, French editions. And he got two friends, dealer friends, because you can't deal, you work in this world without having friends in the, in the, in the, in the trade, because they come to you first with the good books, as long as you buy once in a while, etc. So two friends, good friends, he said, I got these great Whitman books. Now he's living in Boston because he's on disability, his sister's in Boston. And they look at it and say, wait a minute, Whitman, there are only five copies in the world, and two of them, you got two of them? And so they said, well, look, we don't have this cash available. So right now, come back tomorrow or the next day or whatever. And the two, two dealers got in and 
they put in the money to buy them. And so Jim came back the next day with his two copies and the FBI were waiting. And so he got busted. It's public records, so you know. It's just that I, 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 listen, I said this guy to counseling three times for his alcohol abuse. However, the point is counselors work for the Library of Congress and they know this. So anything you say to a counselor there is used, can be used against you. So he did get arrested, he did get convicted, um, and he got one year house arrest. And I actually ran into him three years ago at a rare book reception, which I won't go into, which is really why this book that I have that's all down the hall came about, uh, at least the, the final iteration of this. This started 20 years ago, this book. So, I mean, there are things like this that when, there's nothing you can do because they checked you, they checked him, they checked your case, they don't know. But if it's not cataloged, there's no marking on it. You don't know if it's his book or the library's book. And that is the problem with anything that's not cataloged, whether it's, a, manuscripts aren't gonna be calendared most of them, you're archivists, you know that, many of you. So I, I know we're running out of time and I could go, to, there was one theft that I found about here, which is just pure money. It was just the Lewis Laws paper where we bought them twice because half of the collection, when we bought them in the 70s, and then we bought them back. Some Two dealers, actually, it was over time, offered them to us from different uh, localities. And when we finally bought them back, the Lewis Laws, he was the warden of Sing Sing, the most famous warden, and one of our most used collections. We found the first librarian's address book in the collection. So he bought them and then sold them, half of them. And then we bought, at least we got them back. It was just money. I mean, it was more important to get the, the papers back. But I do have one. I do have a solution. And it's a harsh solution. I mean, you have to be hard in certain areas. Have an airport scanner, full body scanner. I'm, I'm serious. If you're really serious about theft, we're not going to do body searches. But if the airports can do it and see if you're take, you could put, you can go into, you know, you have surveillance cameras all over here, but you can go into a bathroom with something looking like you're carrying a book and you could put it in anything like uh, who's the land dog you're talking about, who had this, the pockets or if you have a full body scanner, it's hard to get away with. You'll, you'll all be scanned on the way out, so just prepare yourself. So thank you again to all our speakers. And I'm just going to take a literal few sentences to sum up. Uh, we've heard a lot tonight about the difficulty or even impossibility of preventing insider theft. But one trend among the talks that I heard was that uh, increasing efforts to prevent this type of theft can take this form of small, e relatively easy to implement steps, steps like making sure everyone knows that there will be random item or shelf checks, um, knows that there will be a clear system of reporting for those who notice red flags, um, knows that there'll be credit checks for new employees or possibly even continuing ones. I'll also note cultivating relationships with scholars, dealers, and collectors who often seem to be the ones to notice suspicious sales. If they feel loyalty and connection to institutions, they'll notice, refuse to buy, um, report, and or return um, stolen goods. Uh, in essence, unless institutions have endless funds to digi digitize, catalog, microchip, et cetera, their entire collections, they need to be creative to find these types of ways to prevent theft. And hopefully hearing the stories tonight will have spurred your creativity. Um, now, I think we've run out of time for, for group questions, but please feel free to um, take one of my cards, bother our speakers now, um, and see the Brownsville Boys exhibition on the other side of this floor before you leave. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>